I think our kids, most of our kids are already back there, and Lucas has got a really bad virus. And he's got, the doctor told him he had to stay in bed for a couple of days. But may the Lord give uh, Lucas healing, and may the Lord keep the rest of his family from getting the virus. But Scott, good to have you here, and convey our love to the rest of your family, and that we miss them. Thank you, Stephanie, for doing Children's Church. That's fantastic. Uh, Cindy's grandson is here today, uh, back there. Um, with the Rob Net Boys, so that's really fun. Um, it's good. Wow, you know what you can learn in worship? Did you know you could bring a beatbox to church? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and did you know, I'm sure you knew about this, there's a World Happiness Report. How many of you read the World Happiness Report? Yeah, me neither. But for 2018, um, I actually found a World Happiness Report. And I learned some things about America. Uh, I don't think this is a bell curve, but this looks like a bell. And I'm not going to pretend to know what these things have to do with happiness. And I didn't read the report in detail. But there were some things that stood out to me. Um, This is um, a chart that shows obesity among adults in 2015. And at the top, those are the least obese nations, Japan, Korea, Italy. I don't know, I'm going to start eating pizza and pasta a little more. Um, But guess what nation's at the bottom? I mean, we won that one big time if you look at the chart, right? I mean, we're right at the bottom with Mexico, New Zealand, and of course, Hungary. You know they're going to be down there somewhere. Um, But look at this, opioid use disorders. And uh, the more blue it is, the less... Uh, disorder, less abuse of opioids, and the more orange it is, or the more red it is, um, the more abuse. And we're right up there at the top, opioid abuse. And the thing that blows me away is that, you know, if, if wealth and um, a, an easy lifestyle um, brought happiness, America shouldn't be struggling more than any other nation in the world with opioid abuse. I mean, and I know there are tons of factors that go into this, and I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not pretending to really know anything, but it's just an amazing fact to me that you can see America is the worst. Then you get orange uh, Russia, and right below Russia, you see Iran and Iraq um, are up there. Um, that's a bit surprising too, I guess. Um, but look at all the blue nations who don't have a lot of opioid abuse. What's going on in America? Look at this. Major depressive disorder. Now, if you are in Greenland, you're in trouble. Or Iran. Or Morocco. In Africa. Are you impressed that I know that's Morocco? I looked it up. <laughs> I had to look it up. But now I know that's Morocco. Um, uh, Those are the bad ones. Um, But right after that, America, Australia, Sweden, Finland, the eastern, some of the eastern bloc countries. But why is America up close to the top with uh, issues of depression? And again, this is complicated. I don't know, maybe it's overdiagnosed or, you know, maybe we're, maybe we're um, you know, sensitive and aware of our own situation and we think about that more. I guess, you know, if you don't know what you're going to eat that day and you're worried about that, you don't have time to be depressed, I suppose. I don't know. But it just amazes me. The next chart really makes sense to me. I'm not really sure why this is in the World Happiness Report. I, well, okay, I know why it's in the World Happiness Report. How can you be happy without coffee? So this is coffee availability in the United States, and that peaked in 1946. I don't know. We got enough coffee in my house. I don't know what that even means. But, but carbonated soda, right? So if you want to be happy, drink more coffee and less carbonated soda. I don't know, right? Um, I just kind of put that in there to be funny. But that really was in the World Happiness Report, and so I don't know what they think coffee has to do with happiness. Um, I do know that sales for antidepressants in the U.S. have gone up over 400% in the last few decades, two or three decades. And experts believe that the majority of people taking these drugs for depression are not clinically depressed, which, you know, is long-term, deep, 
bad unhappiness that you can't get out of and it, it causes you not to function in life. Um, but simply experiencing the normal sadness of everyday life. You ever experience the normal sadness of everyday life? And if that's what you're experiencing, it might not be the right solution to have an antidepressant drug. And I'm not going to stand up here and pretend to be a doctor and say they're bad or good or whatever. Right? The only point I want to make is I think we're struggling as a nation. Now, Jordan Peterson. Um, Jeff sent me a couple of videos from him, and I looked at that and some other ones. And I've quoted him. This guy is on fire, um, popularity-wise, in America. Right? And I've seen him on television several times, and only once did I ever see him smile. You watch his videos, he doesn't smile. He's just got a piercing look, and he just, he just tells the truth. And really, what he's really doing is battling hard against the narrative by just telling the truth from the perspective of a psychology professor. He's not a Christian, but he has said that it's really a good thing to, to go to church and live like a Christian. Isn't that right, Jeff? Something like that. I do believe he comes from a theistic point of view. And, and his theistic point of view, whether he would call it that or not, is what motivates him to battle so hard against current culture in Canada and in America. So I would encourage you, look up Jordan Peterson and watch some of his videos. The guy is amazing. Um, uh, in one, I heard him say, life can be meaningful enough to justify its suffering. Life includes suffering, doesn't it? I mean, if you lived long enough, you know that life includes suffering. And sometimes life can include a lot of suffering. But his point of view is that life can be meaningful in spite of the suffering in life. And he said, we have two choices. We can think and live like nothing I do is meaningful. Or we can think and live like everything I do is meaningful. If nothing I do is meaningful, then I don't have any responsibility. That sounds really great, doesn't it? If everything I do is meaningful, then I do have responsibility. So you're kind of in this vice in that choice. Because the, the idea of no responsibility is really attractive, right? And that's why they have a little thing called vacation, <laughs> where you unplug. And maybe some of us don't do that enough, and maybe some of us do that too much, right? Um, but it's good to have a break from responsibility. And if I could say today, I'm going to decide I'm not going to have any responsibility in my life, wouldn't that feel great? But what would that lead to down the road? Where do you think leads to more happiness? So I can have a level of happiness now that I could be careening toward who knows what. Or I could decide, you know what, what I do is meaningful. Therefore, I have a responsibility to do right and to do meaningful things. But check this out. If nothing I do is meaningful, then I'm not meaningful and I don't have a meaningful life. And that's utterly empty. So no responsibility is utter emptiness. But if I'm meaningful and isn't there some, something deep down within you that drives you to want to be meaningful? I mean, I keep going back to the passage in Ecclesiastes that says, um, God made us finite creatures, limited creatures, so that we don't know from the end from the beginning, but he set eternity in our hearts, which means he made us limited, finite creatures in all of our abilities, in our existence, but he made us crave the infinite. And if you don't crave the infinite, then you've squashed that down, and that's not a good place to be. 
And when you crave the infinite in the deepest part of your soul, what you're saying is, I crave to be meaningful. But not just meaningful, I crave to be infinitely meaningful. But there's nothing by yourself that you can do that has infinite meaning. In other words, the only place you're going to go to find infinite anything. Where is it? There's only one thing that's infinite in the universe. God. Our only connection with the infinite is God. Our only connection with infinite meaning is God. And another thing that Jordan Peterson says, and I don't have up here, is that the way you deal with the suffering of life, and he's kind of saying this in what I have up there. The way you deal with the suffering of life is to take responsibility. And that gives you meaning. And it gives you so much meaning that the meaning is greater than the suffering. Isn't that amazing? So in many ways, you know, he's, he's out there battling for a certainly theistic and kind of a Christian message, and he's not even a Christian. It's amazing. So which of those options results in greater happiness? You might think, today, I'm going to live a life with no responsibility. Do whatever I want. Forget what's right and wrong. Forget tomorrow. Forget next week. Forget a year, ten years from now. I'm going to do whatever I want. And, you know... It's nice kind of to take a day once in a while where we can still, you know, not be crazy, but have a little vacation from a lot of our responsibilities. But not a vacation from God, right? Which of those two things is going to result in greater happiness? Remember I said that as my kids were growing up, the thing that I told them, and it was my genuine desire. What I wanted for my kids was for them to be as happy as possible. You know what? You know what I want for our church? For us to be as happy as possible. I do. I want us all to be as happy as possible. And that doesn't mean that we're never going to have moments of sadness. But I know for us to be happy, then we're going to have to, and I would tell my kids, number one, what's the most important thing? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the second most important thing? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's responsibility. That's picking up what is right and living according to that and being in those relationships, which is really important. And when you have those things in order in your life, then that's how you're going to maximize happiness. So I didn't raise children just to be good Christians and good citizens, no matter how miserable it made them. I raised children to be those things because I knew that's what would make them happy. Long-term, deep happiness. And I don't stand up here and preach all kinds of stuff to, to all of you, you know, so that we can be good Christians no matter how miserable it makes us. Everything I, everything I teach the church on a certain level is because that's where you go if you want to be happy. And that's kind of what Jesus says. Right? All over the place, if you read Jesus, he's telling us that all over the place. So is your world happy? I want to look at a, a couple of passages, um, three to be precise. I've been thinking about a few things. What is the relationship between wisdom and maturity? And I asked myself and others the question, can you separate wisdom and maturity? And I don't think you really can. You can't have one without the other. They're different things. Um, Wisdom is the ability to see reality and live successfully in it. You might be able to see reality, but then if you make failing choices, that's not wise. But you're able to see what is real. And in the context of what is real, you, you live successfully in that reality. That's wisdom. And you can apply wisdom to spiritual things, emotional things. You can apply this to business. If you're in a business, then you, you see the reality of the, your business climate. And you figure out how you can live successfully in that reality. And those of you who've been in business uh, know that that's necessary and that's wise. And if you're wise you have a chance of succeeding, and if you're foolish, you have less, much less chance of succeeding. You apply that to all of life, spirituality. What's the reality? If you're a theologian, you will say the ground of reality, the ground of reality is what? God. What does that mean? That means that all of reality flows from God. That means the nature of reality is determined by the nature of God. 
The narrative's trying to change reality, isn't it? The, the narrative is pretending, and know this, um, the people of the narrative are religious people, and they have a religious commitment to the narrative. And it doesn't matter if it makes sense. Think of it this way. If someone said to you, Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and rising from the dead does not make logical sense. Would you say, oh, okay, then I'm not going to believe that. Um, No, because you have a religious commitment to that. And I think it does make quite logical sense. But I see the logic of it. An unsafe person, do they see the logic of it? Usually not. But you and I have a religious commitment to the cross and to the resurrection. And we're not letting go of it no matter what. Amen? Understand that that's how people of the narrative think about their things too. Right? Um, What is maturity? Maturity is, this word complete, is the word for maturity in the New Testament. So to be mature means to be complete, to be fully developed, fully grown. And a great sign of maturity is reproduction. So maturity and wisdom, I think, always go together. But what's the relationship between maturity and wisdom and happiness? Can you be happy if you're not mature or wise? Yeah, you can. But how long-lasting and consistent will the happiness be? Okay? Kid in the grocery cart goes through the checkout, sees the candy bars. The kid's immature. Kids can be so immature. Especially babies. Right? Kid's immature, sees the candy bar, cries to get the candy bar. The parent does what? A lot of options. I think I'm actually going to start saying to parents, all right, take that attitude, add 10 years to it, and give it a driver's license. And see what you got. And, you, and parents should think that way, right? Because you might be able to do something about that now. Once that has a driver's license, it's real hard to do something about that, right? So let's say the parent buys the kid a candy bar. Is the kid happy? Yeah. How long is that kid going to stay happy? And how deep is that happiness, right? But this is the point of wisdom and maturity. Wisdom and maturity enables deeper, more long-lasting, more consistent happiness. Boy, have I seen some shifts in my lifetime. I thought the people who were born in 1900 and saw everything from the car to the airplane develop, you know, they lived in a time of great change. I've lived in a time of great change. I remember when I was a kid, society was kind of respectful of Christianity. And I remember there was a television station. You guys aren't going to believe this. When I was a kid, there were like four channels, right? And, and then for, um, when I uh, was in junior high, we moved up to the mountains, and the reception wasn't good. And by that, I mean you had to have an antenna. There was no cable or anything, so you had an antenna, and you caught the things through the air, right, like a radio. And we only got one channel. And we were not too far from Phoenix, but the channel we got was from Tucson, right? So we had one channel. That was it. If you wanted to watch television, you had one channel. Um, so, but normally, you had, like, maybe four channels. And um, I remember one of the channels... Um, at certain points during the broadcast day. It couldn't have been late at night because I was just a kid. Um, But they would put on the screen this Bible verse and a voice would say, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Network television. When I was a kid, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. But I didn't get very old until I think society pretty soon became sort of passively indifferent to God and Christianity. Uh, If that's what they want to do, just leave them alone over there. We'll do our thing. Right now, I think society is aggressively attacking God and Christianity. Society is in a place of aggressively attacking Christianity. And I think that's probably a big part of the reason why you see those things I showed you about America. Um, There are a lot of non-Christian countries that don't have the problems, but I think it's a a shift in in coming to the place of aggressively attacking God that has chipped away at our ability in America to be happy. So I think think that that maturity... And and I was going to say, another thing that's changed is 
I didn't used to have to sell people on the value of maturity. I could just say, you want to be mature, don't you? Well, of course. So here's how you be mature. Okay? I can't start there now. I got to say, hey, it's really of great value to be mature. Because your happiness will be deeper. I got to start with that truth. Because becoming mature is sometimes painful. It requires effort. Right? So now we got to back up and explain, well, why do you want to be mature in the first place? The more I go through this mission statement or vision statement, whatever you want to call it, the more it resonates with me. You know, as you start at the top, with love. It starts with love. And those things enable worship. Remember, People usually define worship in very emotional terms, and worship is emotional, and it's an important part of worship. But the heart of worship is making a choice to submit to God. That's how the Bible teaches us to define worship. Making a choice to submit to God. And when we do that, that enables us there in the middle to enjoy Christ, to enjoy God. And when those things get put together, that enables us to share Christ in a powerful way. But then when you think about the end goal of these things being to present everyone mature in the wisdom of Christ, I'm realizing more and more how worshiping Christ, we talked about that last week, um, seeing ourselves in submission to Christ contributes to and is fed by maturity and wisdom. What's the beginning of wisdom? Fear of God. See the connection between worship and maturity and wisdom? And I'm also seeing that um, enjoying Christ and maturity and wisdom feed one another. And I have a feeling I'm going to see how sharing Christ and maturity and wisdom feed one another. So here's the takeaway. The longer our perspective, the deeper our happiness the longer our perspective, the deeper our happiness. In other words, if I'm making choices entirely involved with being happy today, how deep do you think my happiness is going to be? Lately, I've had so many people come to me and say, so many people I know are depressed. So these statistics are not just America. I'm hearing this. My friends are depressed. My family's depressed. I'm depressed. Why? I do think a lot of it is because we think about today. Making choices to be happy today. How deep is my happiness going to be if that's all the further down the road I'm thinking? Remember Romans 12? Literally, do not be conformed to this age. Do not let your thinking begin and end with this earthly life. Because if it does, you've left out the most important part of reality. God and the afterlife. But be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. I actually saw this advertisement on television. (laughs) And then I found this picture online. It's an advertisement for vodka. Seriously? Tomorrow is overrated? I mean, you got to think like that if you're going to get blitzed tonight. (laughs) I've never had a hangover, but I hear that they're not fun. Okay, there's the narrative for you. They've tapped into it. Tomorrow is overrated. I was supposed to move this, and I didn't. I'll just use it right now. Um, I, I couldn't believe that. And yesterday we had a uh, Eagle Scout ceremony in church here. And again, I was privileged to pray, opening and closing for that. But I was impressed with the Scout Oath. Um, This is over 100 years old now. And this oath and law is from a bygone era, isn't it? It says, on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty. Boy, that was good timing. (laughs) 
You know, I always think, if somebody calls, that better be Jesus. That might be Jesus. <laughs> Man, you can't buy that, can you? On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the scout law, which we'll look at, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong and mentally awake and morally straight. The scout law, scout is trustworthy, helpful, courteous, obedient, thrifty, clean, and reverent. Values of a bygone age. That's why I'm thrilled to let the scouts come. Uh, Dan, you've been involved with that troop for a long time. And that troop follows these, and they quoted those things more than once yesterday. And a lot of those guys running that are Christians, and I'm thrilled to let them come and use our church for the Eagle. That's a, a great accomplishment, Eagle Scout. Right? I mean, yeah, okay, so are the scouts struggling in some ways? I think so. But that's a good troop, and I appreciate that. Um, but isn't that... Isn't it almost funny to read that and hear that and to think that, you know, oh, this is what we're teaching our kids to value. So, again, the longer our perspective, the deeper our happiness. All right, I want to give you a narrative update. Avery, we, we, we call the current world philosophy, what the Bible calls the world, we call that the narrative, right? Because you always hear about the narrative. You watch the news and stuff, you hear them use that term, don't you, the narrative? Right? I'm going to give you a narrative update, but this narrative update is 3,000 years old. Can you believe it? This is not current events, but it is current events. Psalm 2. David, King David writes Psalm 2, and it turns out to be a narrative update. What does he say? Why are the nations in an uproar? Are the nations in an uproar? <laughs> I think you could almost, uh, well, I think you can't. I think you could... Um, slot in where it talks about nations, individuals, or individual people. Why are individual people in an uproar? Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed. Brothers and sisters, don't you think that's where we are today? where society is taking counsel together against God. And they say, get this, let us tear their restraints apart and cast away their cords from us. Why don't they just leave us alone? Because we are a light and we are salt for upholding moral values, moral restraints. And it's offensive to the narrative. It's offensive to the godless. Are you kidding me? You're going to tell me how I'm supposed to live my life? Don't judge. Or haters going to hate. Mr. McJudgy Pants, right? He who sits in the heavens laughs. Now, I've heard over and over, God has a sense of humor. And I want to tell you, I hope God has a sense of humor. But I also want to tell you, I've never seen a smidgen of evidence in the Bible that God has a sense of humor. What I see in the Bible is, when God laughs, it ain't good. And if you can find me a place in the Bible where God laughing is great, you know, it's like, ah! That's a D slapper. You know, if you can find a place in the Bible, I want to, to see that because I want God to have a sense of humor. You think he does. You look at me and you think God has a sense of humor, right? I haven't found that in the Bible, and this is not an example of it. He who uh, sits in the heaven laughs, and you go, oh, good, at least God's laughing. No, um, the Lord scoffs at them. He, he's laughing that they think they're so powerful, they're so silly, and they think they're so powerful, and they're going to go up against God, and he just goes, oh, man, my button's bigger than yours, or something, I don't know. Um, then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. I want to tell you, I'm supposed to be talking about enjoying Christ, and I want to find these great positive 
passages on being happy. And you'll see why I chose this in a minute, because it talks about being happy, right? Every time you try to find a passage on being happy, at least I do, all of a sudden you get stuff about the judgment of God. What's up with that? I want to talk about being happy. I don't want to talk about the judgment of God. And it struck me that the reality of God's judgment is necessary for us to be happy. It's a necessary motivation toward deep, lasting happiness. If you don't want to deal with the reality of God's judgment, your chances of being happy just went way down. In this unjust world, if God doesn't judge, God is not good. God is not good, and God is not all-powerful. This world is ultimately unjust, unfair. And God's going to make it right. If God doesn't judge, there's no cross. If God doesn't judge, there's no reason for us to deal with our sin. There's no reason for us to get out of our sin. If God doesn't judge, there's no motivation for us to even have a relationship with God. You heard of the curse? You heard of Adam and Eve being driven out of the garden? That's judgment. Why? God didn't want Adam and Eve to be perfectly happy without him. They may be perfectly happy in their mind, but they're not perfectly happy without God. You take away the judgment of God, you take away happiness. Who would have thought? Right? So he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me... I have installed my king, and this is King David writing, upon Zion, Jerusalem, my holy mountain. Oh, little King David. He's always fighting the nations around him, isn't he? He says, I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's quoted in Hebrews, applied to Christ. So God said that to David, David thought, but it actually ultimately applies to Christ. It applied to David, but it ultimately applies to Christ. The Messiah. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Please notice the mixed emotions. We get so simplistic and we think, I can either be happy or sad. I can either rejoice or tremble. I can either love God or fear God. Not true. Not true. We need to gather a lot of emotions together in our relationship with God. And he says, rejoice with trembling. Honor the Son. Literally, kiss the Son. Interesting, isn't it? Do homage to the Son. Show friendship and submission to the, to the Son. That he not become angry. There we go again. And you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. And then look how it ends. How happy, blessed, how happy are all who take refuge in him. So, if you want to be happy, don't avoid the idea of the judgment of God. Deal with the judgment of God. Deal with that properly. And that's one important way that you get to sustained, deep happiness. So, we learn in Psalm 2, a society without God is chaotic, wicked, and blind. You could say an individual without God is chaotic, wicked, and blind. A society, individual without God will be judged by God. A society without God would be wise to turn to God. God's people should make sure to be on God's side. Remember we said before, there's a time that comes when you need to pick the side you're on, or be on the side you're on, right? Uh, So remember, the longer our perspective, the deeper our happiness. God didn't judge me today. Uh Oh, that means it's not coming, right? Hmm, Maybe not. Um, But now back up to Psalm 1. How happy is the man? Oh, good. That's a great psalm for happiness. And then it turns negative right away. How happy is the man who does not, look at the progression, walk, stand, sit, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, 
nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh. His delight is in the boundaries God sets. His delight is in um, the expectations of God. His delight is knowing the expectations of God and striving to meet the expectations of God. Can we bring salvation upon ourselves by following the law or working to meet the expectations of God? No, we cannot. Does that mean we should not work to meet the expectations of God? God expects that of us. Now, we're not under the Mosaic law, but don't be deceived. God still has expectations of us. So um, his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. And this Hebrew word for meditate is awesome. It means to mumble under your breath. What if you would go um, along in your life mumbling scripture to yourself? Reciting scripture to yourself under your breath. That's the concept that he's talking about here. Go throughout life speaking to yourself scripture passages or scriptural concepts. Yea, I wanna. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Not a blade of grass that grows up overnight. Isn't it amazing in the spring how blades of grass grow up overnight in Oregon? No, a tree that takes years to grow, that you have to be patient with. This side of Oregon, trees are everywhere because we have so much water. But if you get to Israel or even the other side of Oregon, um, trees concentrate around river beds. Right? You could have miles and miles and miles with almost no trees, and then trees around the riverbed because they need water. This was the picture that David had in Israel. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. When you talk about a tree, you're not talking about a short-term thing. You're talking about a long-term thing. So are you growing in your life grass? Or is your life growing as a tree? And back from my first days of coming here, I told the elders, um, what I want to grow in a church is uh, oak trees. Now, you can grow bamboo really fast. But bamboo is not an oak tree. Then he says, not so the wicked, but they are like chaff. You know what chaff is? When you grow grain, you want the, the seed inside, and it's covered by a husk, and you have to somehow thresh the husk. Now they have combines. You see these big combines that go in the fields, and they, it, it just does. I don't even know how it does it, but it just does all this stuff. But back in the day when David wrote, they would take the grain with the husk, and one of the things they would do is, is put it in an area, and then they would have an ox walk on it with a... A sled in the back that would kind of grind it up and it would bust up the hulk, the, that hulk, that um, chaff. It would turn it into chaff, which is just like little pieces of straw. And then you could take that stuff and you could throw it up into the wind and the heavy grain would come down and the chaff that you don't want, right, gets blown away by the wind. The chaff is what you don't want. The chaff is worthless. The chaff can go wherever it wants. We don't want it. We don't care, right? Um, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away, the wicked. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. And David's reference here to the assembly of the righteous is talking about heaven and eternity. Um, but I'll tell you that this assembly is a picture of heaven. And this assembly is not for perfect people, but it's for people who have a desire to be righteous. I invite all people who don't have a desire to be righteous to come in here, and we'll try to persuade you, right? But, you know, this assembly is the assembly of the righteous in Christ. Amen? For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So the influences in our lives have a huge effect on our long-term happiness. I can't stress that enough. The influences in our lives are so powerful and have such a deep effect on our long-term happiness. The fruit of God's blessing is prosperity and happiness. 
And association with God and his people is stabilizing for now and eternity. God's people are, should be a very positive influence. So the longer our perspective, the deeper our happiness. One more passage very quickly. Galatians chapter 6. You're probably familiar with this verse. It's a really good verse to be familiar with. It says, do not be deceived. Pretty strong language, right? Now, God is not mocked. So if you live like this isn't true, you're mocking God. And he'll laugh. Hmm. Um, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. Farmers know this. You know, you sow wheat, you're going to get what? Wheat, <laughs> right? So whatever you sow in your life, that's what you're going to reap goes on to say, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. Think of a dead, decaying body. But flesh here really means not literally our physical body, but the unredeemed part of us. The unredeemed part of you ever have any influence on your life? The unredeemed part of you ever tug at you? The unredeemed part of you ever tempt you? And when we feed that and give in to that, what we're going to reap is corruption. And we usually think of this verse, the law of sowing and reaping, we call it. We usually think of this verse in negative terms, but it's also positive. Look, um, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Isn't that awesome? Let us not lose heart in doing good. Man, that reminds me of the Boy Scout oath and law. That reminds me of Jordan Peterson. Let us not lose heart in doing good. Because that's sowing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of the faith. And when you're living like that, you're sowing good seeds. So we learn that every choice we make sows seeds in the ground of our lives. So we might choose, oh, I'm, I'm going to say my, nothing's meaningful that I do, and I'm not going to have any responsibility. You're sowing seeds, and you're sowing lots of seeds by that decision. And it's not like I'm, I'm not going to sow any seeds in my life. Now, sorry, all the time you're sowing seeds of one sort or another. Right? It's often hard to see the link between choices and consequences, and there are many reasons for this. And one of the reasons is there's usually a time lag between sowing the seed and the seedling popping up. And then when the seedling pops up, you sometimes can't even tell what it is. One year I had all these little seedlings all over my house, and I was freaked out. I didn't know what they were. I showed them to somebody, and they turned out to be little maple tree seedlings. Right? Fortunately, most of them died off when, when the rain quit. You know, I was like, oh, I don't need 5,000 more maple trees on my property. Uh, right? But some of, them, some of them take root, and they grow. But by the time we see what this plant is in our life, and that it's noxious and nasty, it's hard for us to even connect what sowed that many times. And plus, the, the plant doesn't look anything like the seed a lot of times. So it's just hard to make those connections. But just know, you got nasty things growing in your life? That seed was sown sometime in the past. Know that our future is firmly rooted in our past. And now we're glad that God is a redeeming God. Amen? Today is the time for gardening and planting good seeds. I guess if you plant enough good seeds, it might choke out some of the bad seeds. So what's the takeaway? The longer our perspective, the deeper our happiness. All right, some stuff on happy. A, conta a happiness contagion study. Happiness isn't a solitary experience. It's dependent on others. Harvard researchers followed 4,739 people. How'd they come up with that number? For 20 years, measuring how social networks, siblings, friends, and neighbors are affected by the happiness of others. The study controlled factors of age, gender, education, occupation. Researchers found that 
Close physical proximity is essential for happiness to spread. A happy friend who lives within a half a mile makes you 40% more likely to be happy yourself. Did you know that? If that same friend lives two miles away, the impact drops to 22%. A study by two professors from Harvard and UCSD, I guess that's San Diego, these two doctors found that when a person becomes happy, this is funny to me, next door neighbors have a 34% increased chance of becoming happy. A friend living within one mile has 25% increased chance of becoming happy. But siblings have a 14% increased chance of becoming happy. And a spouse only has an 8% chance of becoming happy. <laughs> Turns out to be more important if your neighbors are happy. Or if you're a happy neighbor. All right, how do we apply all this? Just in a minute. True deep happiness requires that we rebel against the narrative. The narrative is hostile to God. The narrative undermines maturity, wisdom, and deep lasting happiness. Two, true deep happiness is rooted in maturity and wisdom. If you want that, then seek maturity and wisdom. Here's the thing about happiness. If you make it your goal to gain happiness and the focus of your pursuit is happiness, what can I guarantee you you will not have? Happiness. You make it your goal to be happy, and you will not be happy. You make it your goal to be mature and wise. You make it your goal to follow Christ. You make it your goal to take up your cross and follow Christ. Now what are you likely to have? Happiness. Maturity and wisdom take the long view. And it even takes a little bit of maturity to see the importance of that, doesn't it? Third, finding enjoyment in Christ feeds maturity and wisdom. And maturity and wisdom feeds finding enjoyment in Christ. So if you want to be happy, focus on enjoying Christ. Learn about Christ. Know Christ. Walk with Christ. Enjoy Christ then you'll have a longer perspective. The longer our perspective, the deeper our happiness. Christ followers have an eternity of reasons to be happy today. Amen? Amen. Uh, I kind of went long, sorry. So I'm going to pray and do the benediction, Avery, and uh, then we're going to party. And you're welcome to stay and, and party with us a little bit because today is a wonderful day. Um, as was said before, celebrating the anniversary of Canon Norma Dagman, and that was April 14th. And Ken told me they were miscalculating. They looked at their wedding license. It's actually 56 years. 